Its distinctive houses of worship can be seen all over the world. Every year, hundreds of new ministers are being ordained. Every year, hundreds of thousands of people in different countries listen to its teachings and are joining the church. And it has helped millions of people through its humanitarian efforts, setting world records in the process. Registered in the Philippines on July 27, 1914, it is now well established in more than 110 countries and territories, with members from over 110 races and nationalities. This is the Iglesia Ni Cristo, the Church of Christ. Questions have been asked for years about the Iglesia Ni Cristo's amazing success. In 1992, in an article published in Philippine Panorama, Robert C. Villanueva, a journalist, wrote, The Iglesia Ni Cristo, a dynamic and rapidly expanding church. For many years now, theologians and critics have tried to pry open the secrets which propel the Iglesia Ni Cristo to such tremendous growth. Why are people attracted to it? Why does it grow so fast? Its cathedrals and chapels are impressive landmarks in all of the provinces, cities, and towns. Tracing the history of the Iglesia Ni Cristo takes us to where it all began, the Philippines. For nearly four centuries, Philippine history was dominated by only one church, the Roman Catholic Church. But as the 20th century approached, revolutionary changes were already brewing. 1896, Philippine national hero, Jose Rizal, was executed by the Spanish colonizers under the influence of the Catholic friars. The cry for Philippine independence was heard. A revolt of the Filipino people against Spain was soon followed, however, by colonization by the United States of America and the arrival not only of American troops, but also American Protestantism. Philippines is unique in its Catholic history because by 1898, 1899, the Americans have come in and established an American empire. The predominant religion would be Protestant churches, Congregationalist, um, Anglican, Episcopalian. In the midst of these changes, a young Filipino man from a poor barrio in the outskirts of Manila, Brother Felix Y. Manalo, began preaching about the Iglesia Ni Cristo. It was November 1913, and workers of Atlantic Gulf and Pacific Company in Punta Santa Ana, Manila, were the first to listen to his preaching. Those who believed were baptized in a nearby river and constituted the pioneering members of the first local congregation of the Iglesia Ni Cristo, the local congregation of Punta Santa Ana. Brother Felix Manalo's unyielding conviction to teach only from the Bible became well known around Manila, and many were attracted to the words of God delivered by this dynamic young preacher. The Iglesia Ni Cristo's membership began to grow, but this early success did not sit well with the communities where the propagation of the church began. Neighbors were wary of these non-Catholic teachings he was bringing, if some had accepted the various American Protestant sects, when a fellow Filipino coming from the poorer, less educated sectors of society began teaching something far different from what they were used to, most reacted, even with hostility. Many of the early members were laughed at by their neighbors for listening to a poor, fellow Filipino. Some were even rejected by their family members for joining the Iglesia Ni Cristo. One form of persecution was to question the legality of the church's existence. Since there were already baptized members, Brother Felix decided to register the Iglesia Ni Cristo to make it a legal entity. On July 27, 1914, Brother Felix went to the Office of the Division of Archives, Patented Properties of Literature, and Executive Office of Industrial Trademarks to register the church with the Philippine government. The date could not have been more prophetic. Unbeknownst to most of the world, let alone the Philippines, 
The Austrian army launched a sneak attack on Serbia in the early morning hours of July 27, 1914, and war was declared on that same day. This war would be known as the First World War. World War I is an interesting war in its origins and its causes. Then it got out of control for four years with trench warfare, um, uh, the first airplanes used in war. The impact of World War I, um, even in its deaths, its technology, would have lasted throughout the 20th century. Even with the church registered, the persecution did not end. In fact, it increased even further. The predominantly Catholic neighbors of the early church members would disturb the gatherings of the Iglesia Ni Cristo and the Bible studies by throwing stones or mud at the listeners. At times, Catholic community leaders would prohibit the church from conducting missionary works in public squares or plazas. Catholic leaders underestimating Brother Felix challenged him to public religious debates. Soon, they were joined by U.S.-trained Protestant pastors who also wanted to debate Brother Manalo. Are you starting another denomination? So it would take a man of charismatic uh, capability to start that. Yung missionary movement ba, nga support of the church comes from the outside. Kung wala yun, uh, mawawala yan. Uh, mawawala yung church. As opponents of the young organization increased, other problems also began to pile up. The Church of Christ had no material wealth of its own and was not affiliated with any other organization. As a result, it had no source of financial support from the outside. With all these challenges, the Church of Christ faced serious problems. How would the Church continue with the work of salvation? It had no sufficient funds. Powerful organizations were against it. What was the chance the church would survive and succeed? For inspiration and guidance, Brother Felix Manalo held on to a promise recorded in the Holy Bible. Thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, and called thee from the chief men thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant, I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. Fear thou not, for I am with thee, be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. It was not only despite persecution. Some would say that it was because of the growing number of public debates brought on by the persecution that the Iglesia Ni Cristo membership prospered. Hundreds and hundreds were curious to hear Brother Felix preach and many were convinced to accept the Bible-based beliefs of the church. With the rapid growth in membership, Brother Felix Manalo also established what was called Anclase, or The Class, where he trained young volunteers to become ministers, effective helpers in propagating the words of God and edifying the church. He is uh, uh, clearly uh, uh, a powerful personality, uh, a uh, decent administrator, if not a great administrator. Um, uh, and, uh, he was uh, very effective in uh, training his uh, lieutenants. And so. Ministers, evangelical workers, and church officers worked hand in hand with Brother Felix Waimanalo. But the early pioneering ministers had no easy task ahead of them. Most did not have a high level of formal education. Like Brother Felix, Many of those early ministers also came from poor families, and there was no visible means of financial support. They faced grave challenges in fulfilling their duties such as hunger, fatigue, and being strangers to the places they would be sent. Brother Felix emphasized to those pioneering ministers the biblical message of Apostle Paul, a minister of the church during the New Testament times, who also had to endure so much for the sake of preaching God's words. I have become its minister, according to God's administration that was given to me for you, to make God's message fully known. We proclaim him, 
warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. I labor for this, striving with His strength that works powerfully in me. Holding on to these biblical truths, the ministerial workers of the church led by Brother Felix Manalo never stop sharing the truth and taking care of the church. More people embraced the true faith, and local congregations were established. The church grew at an unexplainable rate. No matter how the other religions sought to prevent it, challenging the church workers in debates or influencing government officials to suppress their freedom to proclaim God's words in public places. Brother Felix Manalo with only a handful of ministerial workers worked day and night to make sure that the faith of the members would be strong enough to survive hardship and persecution. But with so few of them to oversee, how could they make sure the members would not be led astray from the faith by preachers from other religious groups or be strong enough to withstand the severe persecution and still remain in the church? The task was pressing. Failure to resolve this would lead to the collapse of the church. For an answer to these daunting challenges, Brother Felix Monalo looked once again to the Bible and guidelines that were given to Moses in establishing the first nation of God. Your job is to teach them the rules and instructions, to show them how to live, what to do. And then you need to keep a sharp eye out for competent men, men who fear God, men of integrity, men who are incorruptible, and appoint them as leaders over groups organized by the thousand, by the hundred, by fifty, and by ten. As overall administrator of the church, or the church's first executive minister, Brother Felix organized the administration of the church. Members in a particular geographical area with a house of worship as a centralized worship location he formed into a local congregation. Over each local congregation, he placed one of the newly trained ministers along with a volunteer deacon from the congregation as a head deacon to assist the minister in caring for the brethren. As the church began spreading to neighboring provinces outside Manila, he grouped the local congregations of each province into ecclesiastical districts and assigned more seasoned ministers to oversee the districts. It was the supervising or district minister who was tasked to directly oversee the ministers in the local congregations, solve the more difficult problems, and report the overall condition of the district's local congregations to the executive minister. Through this system of centralized administration, Brother Felix Manalo was able to maintain the unity of the church's teachings. Once again, Brother Felix had looked to the Bible for guidance and inspiration in overseeing the church. Even for non-members, the Iglesia Ni Cristo's unity has become a distinct hallmark of the church. In the worship service lessons and programs for the worship service, the whole church is united. Even in the hymns for worship, the church's unity is seen. I think if there's one thing about the church, uh, the Iglesia Ni Cristo church, it's about consistency. You know, the teachings of the church, the Iglesia and Christian Church, remains very consistent. The Christian family organizations were also established. This was to make sure that each Christian family is properly cared for and strengthened in the faith. The Christian family organizations were also of great help in inviting people to listen to the preaching of the words of the Lord God. Missionary campaigns, now called Iglesia Ni Cristo Evangelical Missions, were held. In large congregations where all the members could not fit in the houses of worship with their guests, God's words were proclaimed in public plazas. The Pasugo, God's Message, the official magazine of the Iglesia Ni Cristo was first published in February 1939. It became an effective tool in spreading the words of God. Brother Felix Y. Manalo was the first editor-in-chief of the Pasugo. Just when everything was going well with the church missionary and edification campaigns, and the church was consistent in its growth, another even deadly trial 
came to test the church and the conviction of the members in their calling. the start of World War II, for Americans, it's remembered very easily, December 7, 1941. This one is even more of a global war than uh, World War I. The church was surviving despite religious organizations persecuting it. Hunger and poverty had not hindered the church members from growing stronger. But could it survive an environment of armed conflict and hostility? Once again, Brother Felix turned to the Bible to provide comfort for the members of the Iglesia de Cristo, inspiring them with Apostle Paul's words found in Romans 8, 35-36, 38-39, that having trouble or calamity or being in danger or threatened with death does not mean God has deserted them. The members must be ready to face death at every moment of the day because they have the overwhelming victory on the day of salvation. Nothing can ever separate the faithful church members from God's love, not even death. The lives of the members of the Church of Christ were put in danger. People lived in fear and in even more severe poverty and hunger. Church members were prevented from performing their duties Roads where ministers and evangelical workers had to pass through for their preaching assignments had ensuing battles. Brother Felix Manalo's life, as he always conducted pastoral visitations in various provinces, was always in danger. At times, Japanese soldiers with guns and rifles in hand would break into the worship building at the middle of the service. News spread about the countless casualties of war. Some of them were church members. On their way to fulfill their duties, they gave the greatest sacrifice they could ever give. But no one could stop the brethren from attending worship services. They responded positively to their need to conduct worship services. And there they found their courage and hope restored. People thought that the church's growth would slow down during the war, as what happened with so many other institutions. However, Contrary to this assumption, more local congregations of the church were established even during the war. I was struck uh, reading Leonard Tuggy's work on, on uh, the Iglesia Ni Cristo. I was struck by his uh, um, uh, assertion that during the period immediately after the Second World War, the very rapid expansion of the INC at that time, uh, was a, a corollary to the war in the fact that many people uh, left the bigger cities, Manila and the other. War ended. All brethren in various places conducted Thanksgiving worship services to God, and the church emerged stronger with a larger membership. After the war, another test of faith came. A violent communist insurgent group in the Philippine countryside called The Hook. Brother Felix Y. Manalo's refusal to cooperate with the communists' agenda to overthrow the local governments in the provinces led to The Hook's anger turned to the INC. The Hooks began kidnapping and killing ministers and members of the church. Church members who were spared from war were faced with another threat to their lives and family. The rebels wanted to incite fear in the church members whom they sought to hinder in fulfilling their religious duties. Brother Felix reminded them that even if troubles come one after the other, and they are even faced with a threat of death, God would still continue to save them again and again as they learned to rely on Him at all times. For inspiration, He would read to them about the courageous conviction of Apostle Paul when he thought that at one point he was doomed to die. 
we put everything in the hands of God, and he did help us and saved us from a terrible death. Yes, and we expect him to do it again and again. The church members fervently prayed to God, who in turn immediately answered their prayers. As the Philippine government launched reconciliation and amnesty programs with the Hooks, many of the rebels abandoned their cause to live life anew. As a result, the rebels' forces declined and their persecution of the church gradually ended. With an even larger and continuously growing membership, another challenge arose. Where could the members fit for them to continue conducting orderly worship services? The church, through the leadership of Brother Felix Y. Manalo, simply upheld the commandment of the Lord God based on Haggai 1.8 to construct worship buildings for God's glory. Because of the church members' commitment to obey God's commandment, the church began what it is famous for today, the construction from the ground up of magnificent worship buildings, and this was despite the severe economic crisis that was brought about by the war. Some would argue that it's a mystery. Uh, um, early commentators obviously uh, suggested that the, uh, that the Iglesia de Cristo seemed unable to, to mobilize these resources, but uh, clearly they've, uh, they've proved the opposite. Uh, and uh, uh, through time, it's, it's a, a pretty impressive accomplishment and has dramatically impacted the, uh, the, the, the landscape of the, the city in the Philippines and the town in the Philippines for that matter. What the church today calls the central office was simply a room in Brother Felix's home where he oversaw the development of the church's system of records and reporting the majestic Riverside House of Worship in San Juan was dedicated, and beside this was also constructed what became the central office complex during the rest of Brother Felix's years. The church administration, under the leadership of Brother Felix Y. Manalo, was firm and stable. God used him as an instrument to train ministers and church officers who would care for the church. The Church of Christ spread all over the Philippines. Many prominent personalities recognized the church. The victory of the church became known even abroad. Brother Felix Y. Manalo continued to lead the church members in their active services to God in preparation to meet our Lord Jesus Christ. However, just when the church was gearing towards the celebration of its golden anniversary, a very painful test came to its members. This was a test that was so severe that outside observers believed that the Iglesia de Cristo would soon cease to exist. On April 12, 1963, Brother Felix Y. Manalo, the man who led the church members for almost half a century, was laid to rest. Um, many people felt that uh, the, uh, the church would, um, would wither and disappear after Felix Manalo died. The man who tirelessly preached to them God's words and led them in overcoming all challenges. The man who was dearest to them, who had shared with them the true faith and cared so much for them and their salvation, was now gone. Uh, some external commentators had felt it would, uh, would, it would uh, disappear. Obviously it didn't. Dito sa Deuteronomio, sa Kapitulo 5, pakinggan nyo ang sinasabi dito. Ang wika sa versiklo 32, ganito. 
inyo ngang isasagawa gaya ng pinakuto sa inyo ng Panginoon ng Diyos. Huwag kayong liliko sa kanan o sa kaliwa. Sa makatuhin ng suso ng Diyos, tuhuhin mo yung kanyang ulo. Huwag kang liliko sa kaliwa, huwag kang liliko sa kanan. Kung ano yung inuot sa iyo, tuhuhin ito ang kapanunod ito. Sa makatuhin, Maingat, hindi lamang ituro ng Diyos ang utos niya, kundi itinuturo din ni pagsunod sa kanil kung paano. Kaya katungkulan natin matutunan ang pagsunod. At isang maingat sa pagsunod. Dito rin sa Euphronomio 10 at ang partikulo ay 12 at 10. Tingnan ninyo kung ano pa ang sinasabi ninyo. Ngayon, Anong hinihingi sa iyo ng Panginoon mong Diyos? Yan ang tanong. Ito'y tanong ng mga sisipamahala ng unang tahon sa banyan ng Diyos. At ngayon, anong hinihingi sa iyo ng Panginoon mong Diyos? Kung di matakot ka sa Panginoon mong Diyos, lumakad ka sa at ng kanyang daan, ibigin siya at pag-inpura mo ang Panginoon ng Diyos ng buong puso mo, ng buong alulo mo, nagaganapin mo ang uros ng Panginoon at ang kanyang mga palatuntunan na inaugo ko sa iyo sa araw na ito sa iyong ikabubuti. Anong hihingi ka sa iyo ng Panginoon ng Diyos? Matakot ka ika sa Panginoon ng Diyos at lumakad ka sa lahat ng kanyang daan na ibinigay niya sa iyo. At paglingkuran mo ikaw, Panginoon, mong Diyos ng buong puso, buong kaluluwa mo, naganapin mo ang mga utos ng Panginoon at ang kanyang platuntunan na kanyang pinaupos mo sa araw na ito sa ikabubut mo. Now that Brother Felix Y. Manalo was laid to rest, would the church be able to remain one cohesive body and continue on with its mission? Or would the critics' expectations come true that the Iglesia de Cristo would eventually fall apart once the man who began the mission was gone? Much to the disappointment of the detractors of the Iglesia de Cristo, the church, instead of withering and disintegrating, continued to grow larger and stronger. Ten years before he passed away, on January 28, 1953, Brother Felix Manalo called a conference of district ministers, which unanimously elected Brother Iranio Manalo to succeed Brother Felix as the next executive minister of the Iglesia de Cristo. At that time, Brother Iranio was already an ordained minister, actively leading congregations in various missionary and administrative works. He was the third son of the civil Felix Manolo. He was a very uh, insightful man, although he was quiet. And I think his, uh, his own charisma to lead the people of the church. In the next 10 years after Brother Iranio's election, Brother Felix continued personally teaching Brother Iranio as a public speaker, debater, and administrator of the church. Brother Felix Manalo trained his successor following the biblical precedent set by Moses, who trained his successor, Joshua. On April 23, 1963, after Brother Felix Manalo passed away, the 38-year-old Brother Iranio took the mantle of leadership of the Iglesia de Cristo. The new and young executive minister had a formidable task ahead of him. The only executive minister the members of the church had ever known they recognized as God's last messenger. And they were still grieving the loss of Brother Felix Manalo. Many outside the church doubted that Brother Iranio would be up to the challenge. Accompanied by the senior ministers of the church, Brother Iranio immediately embarked on pastoral visitations in various provinces in the Philippines, consoling the grieving church by continuously teaching what Brother Felix Manalo had always reminded the church members provided that you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel which you heard, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. 
Members of the Iglesia Cristo also never stopped sharing their faith. The church continued the vigorous missionary campaigns and evangelical missions in public plazas, resulting in thousands of new members each month. As new congregations arose, more ministers were needed to keep teaching the growing number of members God's Word. Following the example set by Brother Felix Manalo, Brother Iranio Manalo conducted an ordination of ministers on July 14, 1964. It was followed by more ordinations, strengthening the ministerial workforce to take care of the church. Aware of the growing needs of an ever-expanding church, Brother Iranio also further systematized the reporting of all aspects of the church's condition. This would enable him to oversee every aspect of the church's development, no matter how far the church's growth would reach. Brother Felix Manalo had begun a massive program for the construction of numerous worship buildings. Under Brother Iranio Manalo, this not only continued, but the rate of construction was even able to increase. On July 27, 1964, the Iglesia Ni Cristo successfully celebrated its golden anniversary with Thanksgiving worship services to God held in all the local congregations of the church. The largest of these worship services was held at the Araneta Coliseum, then reportedly the world's largest dome stadium. A 16,500-seater building was filled to capacity with delegates from local congregations all over the Philippines. The mettle of the Iglesia Ni Cristo's young and dynamic leader would be tested early on in his administration of the church. Barely two years in office and the persecution against the church increased. One of the severest took place in a hacienda or large sugarcane plantation in the province of Tarlac. Because of a labor dispute, the church members working as farmers in Hacienda Luisita encountered hostility. They were workers in huge uh, haciendas or, or plantations, whether these be sugar or, or, or rice. That's the tradition we were coming from. Uh, and, and therefore, poverty was systematically built into the, into the feudal system. Non-members spoke ill of the Iglesia Ni Cristo members. They would refuse to sell the brethren food or use public vehicles. What was once one ride to the worship service by jeepney became several kilometer treks under scorching heat or heavy rain. There were times that it was not just their livelihood that was threatened, but even their lives as well. Concerned about the welfare of the members in Hacienda Luisita, Brother Irano turned to the words of God written in the Bible for guidance. He not only continued to edify the members' faith through worship services, but also carefully followed what is written in 1 John 3, 17 to 19, to love the fellow Christians by extending help to them. The church administration promptly instructed that the brethren in Hacienda Luisita be transferred to the province of Nueva Ecija. There, the church had purchased barren land to be developed into a farming community, which they called Barrio Maligaya, inaugurated on February 22, 1965. The church members from different places worked hand in hand to provide shelter and livelihood to over a thousand brethren from the hacienda. This project became a model of community development programs in the whole country. The Barrio Maligaya Resettlement Program started the various housing projects of the Iglesia Ni Cristo all over the Philippines. The phenomenal success of the church became more noticeable not only in the Philippines, but also in other countries. A scholar and professor at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California, Professor Donald McGavran, observed that the Iglesia Ni Cristo has grown very rapidly and as such, is of interest to all concerned with church growth. The persecution in Hacienda Luisita, which the Iglesia Ni Cristo had gone through, seemed to have been much lighter compared to the upcoming challenge the church and its new executive minister had to face. Representative Miguel Cuenco, 
a devout Catholic and a brother of a highly influential archbishop in the Philippines, together with some 80 legislators, introduced House Bill No. 13043, known as the Cuenco Bill, to allow public school teachers designated by a priest or minister to the principal to teach voluntarily religion in public schools. Brother Iranio understood that the bill, in its implementation, especially in the rural areas of the provinces, could be used to open the doors to school-sanctioned religious persecution of children of minority religions in the schools and the teaching of unbiblical religious beliefs to them. As a Protestant author documenting the situation wrote, angered by attempts to railroad the bill through the lower house last March without a public hearing, 20,000 members of the Iglesia Cristo demonstrated before the chamber. The bill was never passed. As the church continued to successfully rise above severe tests and persecution, the world's economic situation was heading the opposite direction. Poverty was getting worse and more widespread. More and more Filipinos could barely afford their basic needs, and many, including Iglesia Ni Cristo members, began looking for greener pasture abroad. Meanwhile, in the United States, a social revolution was underway. Since the American Immigration uh, um, Law of 1965, I think, uh, which allowed for very substantial Filipino migration, this also uh, was a means of very rapid uh, diffusion of the faith, essentially being piggybacked uh, on the Philippine diaspora. Members of the Iglesia de Cristo who found jobs and settled abroad became instrumental for the work of salvation to reach other countries. The year was 1968. There has never been a year like it, according to Mark Kurlansky Cape, a famous author. Time magazine subtitled their 40th anniversary special commemorative edition of 1968 as the year that changed the world. 1968 was one of the most tumultuous years of the post-World War II era. A time of war and assassination, civil unrest, and deep political division. This milestone year in world history was also a milestone year in the history of the Iglesia Ni Cristo. A growing number of church members who had migrated to the United States had been sending requests to the church administration for a minister to be sent to them to oversee their spiritual needs. In early 1968, a drafted petition from the Brethren in San Francisco, followed by another letter personally delivered by a group of Brethren from Hawaii, was brought to Brother Iranyo Manalo. Brother Iranyo was moved by the Brethren's plea. However, how would the church administration respond to this? The number of ministers still wasn't enough to cover all the congregations in the Philippines, and the language of instruction, whether during Bible studies or worship services, had been only in the native tongue. Was the church financially capable to sustain such a mission? Were the ministers, with their families, prepared to be sent to other parts of the world? For guidance, Brother Iranyo steadfastly prayed to God, and turned to the Bible for inspiration. He found the answer. It was written in Isaiah 59, 19 and 43, 5. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. From the far east will I bring your offspring and from the far west I will gather you. Brother Iranyo immediately embarked on a journey to Hawaii on July 27, 1968, he officiated the first worship service in Honolulu. Before proceeding to California to officiate worship services there in the mainland USA, Brother Iranyo left Brother Pedro Memban II to be the first resident minister in Hawaii. In California, Brother Iranyo met with the brethren and joined them in searching for more members there. After officiating the first worship services of the church in California, he left their brother Cipriano Sandoval to be the first resident minister in California. These gatherings mark the beginning of the church's worldwide expansion. The 
And I, I raised the three uh, points. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. ジョニアの マナロ the church all the more intensified in its missionary efforts by proclaiming God's words in large assemblies, both in the Philippines and abroad. To facilitate a faster dissemination of God's words to the masses, the church utilized mass media. In 1967, the church religious views aired over the radio through DZEC, the first church-affiliated radio station. Two years later, the church launched its own radio station, DZEM, on February 1969. The biblical teachings upheld by the Iglesia de Cristo were first aired on television on August 18, 1982. Later, the church launched its own TV program, Ang Iglesia Ni Cristo, over MBS Channel 4. With the success achieved by the initial telecasts, the church TV programs have since been aired over different TV channels. In 1983, the church began airing religious programs outside the Philippines, particularly in California, resulting in even more people joining the Iglesia Ni Cristo the numbers of the brethren were increasing. More local congregations needed to be established. More houses of worship needed to be built. More ministers needed to be recruited and trained. And the church was expanding its means of disseminating the faith as the overseas mission was commencing. As the church quickly spread around the world, the field for the church's work became as vast as the world itself. How could the church take care of the spiritual needs of the brethren in various parts of the world? With the quickly growing needs of the church in mind, while also with a vision of the church's future, Brother Aranyo Manalo planned the construction of a bigger INC central office along Commonwealth Avenue in Quezon City to house the various departments within the church. Many at that time wondered why there. By the late 60s, Commonwealth Avenue was a dark and lonely road, and the land all around it barely developed. With the former central offices located in heavily populated areas like Tundo, San Juan, and Makati, moving to Commonwealth seemed like a step in the wrong direction. However, the vision of the church administration was proven to be guided by the Holy Spirit. On May 10, 1971, the beautiful and magnificent central office of the Iglesia de Cristo was inaugurated along Commonwealth Avenue. It stands majestically in what is today the widest and one of the busiest roads in a key city in the country. As the church gained greater momentum for edification and propagation campaigns, the political and economic condition in the Philippines was deteriorating at an uncontrollable rate. By 1972, political protests became common. The communist insurgency led by the New People's Army modeled after the communists of Maoist China were growing in numbers and boldness. With violence spreading from the rural provinces into the cities, another challenge arose, putting pressure on the church. I signed proclamation number 1081, placing the entire Philippines under martial law. 
definitely there was political turmoil in, in the air. You needed to apply uh, to an office under the office of the president for permission to, to leave the country. The Congress was padlocked, so how could you have debates? There was not a single newspaper that was being circulated. No. Television stations were locked up, were, were, um, were, were closed down. The church was not spared of the effects of martial law. A Cornell University professor, David Werfel, relates in his book, Filipino Politics. On the day martial law was declared, the only bloodshed occurred when armed guards at the Iglesias radio station resisted the takeover by the Philippine army. The brethren's lives were not only put in danger, but their freedom as well to conduct worship services to God and missionary works. The Church of Christ upholds the democratic ideal of separation of church and state. It supports through peaceful and legal means the right and freedom of its members to conduct worship and other religious activities as provided for and protected by the fundamental law of the land. Also, the Church puts a premium on lawfulness and discipline. It complies with the apostolic teaching to submit to human authority, that is, the duly constituted government and abide by its laws. But over and above any law, its members obey the laws of God for Christians in our time, as written in the Bible. The challenge then was, would the church be pressured and stop fulfilling its obligation and be hindered in serving God? In a national referendum for the extension of martial law in 1975, the Iglesia stood openly against it. Professor Werfel writes, President Marcos was furious and called Bishop Manalo to Malacanang, threatening him with retaliation. But the bishop had hundreds of his loyal supporters at the palace gates, and the two men quickly reached an understanding to avoid interference in each other's affairs. Like Brother Felix before him, Brother Eranio Manalo stood firm in making sure that the freedom of the members of the Iglesia de Cristo to carry on their religious services would always be protected. For the church administration, the spiritual welfare of the brethren is a top priority. In the meantime, the Iglesia de Cristo spreading outside the Philippines meant new challenges to face. The members they were overseeing were hundreds of miles apart from each other. Travel would be long and tiring, and at times dangerous due to inclement weather. The members as well shared in the sacrifices also often traveling many hours to make it to the worship services, many of which were held in small rental halls. But no distance or any other hindrance could deter the brethren as they sought peace from their daily struggles in a new land through God's inspiring words being preached so powerfully in the worship services. The church members, as Brother Iranio had always taught them, held on to God's instruction. Some people have given up the habit of meeting for worship, but we must not do that. We should keep on encouraging each other, especially since you know that the day of the Lord's coming is getting closer. Because of this, church members became even more steadfast in the faith, and the congregations continued to grow. In only a few decades, hundreds of local congregations were established covering not only the United States, but also all the habitable continents of the world. And uh, I've noticed that uh, besides the Catholic Church, of course, you have the, the, the second largest congregation. And largest because they're organized is the Iglesia uh, Ni Cristo. Wherever they go, bring with them their faith. With the church now spreading all over the world, spreading the gospel required more ministers to conduct Bible studies and oversee the spiritual needs of the brethren. Many of the pioneering ministers abroad faced language and cultural barriers. Because of this, Brother Iranio saw the need for more standardized training of ministers to take care of the ever-increasing number of congregations. Starting with a program that was used in the Anclase that Brother Felix Y. Manalo instituted as a base, Brother Iranio established in 1974 the Ministerial Institute for Development, which is now known as the College of Evangelical Ministry, 
a formal educational institute for the training of ministers. Um, the church spends a great deal of um, money and effort in, uh, in its training programs, uh, ministerial training programs as, uh, as well as more in frame in terms of bureaucratic. While giving prime concern to the administration of the spiritual needs of its members, the church continued to be responsive to the needs of the society at large, willing to extend its help to members and non-members alike. Under Brother Iranio Manalo's direction, the Iglesia Ni Cristo established programs which provide relief goods and various health services, including medical and dental missions, family planning teams, and nutrition education. In addition to this, during the administration of Brother Iranio, the church, attending to the educational needs especially of the youth, established a non-sectarian and non-profit school, the New Era University. The Iglesia Ni Cristo continues to provide various community service programs in all the places where it is established, from the remotest villages of the provinces to the most prominent urban areas of the metros. The church should provide, again, spiritual support, but at the same time, socioeconomic support so that they can practice what they learn from the church. Knowing the importance that the Bible places on strong family values, the church all the more intensified the involvement of the Christian family organizations, which had been established since the time of Brother Felix Manalo to edify their faith. The Buklod, Kadiwa, and Binhi led the church in various missionary and edification efforts and launched social projects such as the adult education, summer kindergarten, and community and environmental programs. You know, one thing I was very impressed by the, some of the Iglesia Ni Cristo people I met, they are highly disciplined, very, very hardworking, they are serious locals. Your church also emphasized that the collective cooperation among the church members. With the church's continuous growth, also came the need for bigger worship buildings where Iglesia Ni Cristo members could worship God. In the early 80s, as the church approached its 70th anniversary, Brother Iranio Manalo began the plan for the construction of the Iglesia Ni Cristo's biggest worship building, a temple close to the church's central office where thousands of church members could conduct worship services to God. There was one problem, however. We had a, a, a number of a series of economic crisis. First you had the oil prices of 1973-74 and then 1979-1980. And then after that in 1983-84 we had the first debt crisis. That debt crisis was actually uh, set off by the Mexican debt default on its debts. The plan seemed to be untimely. The country was beset with unprecedented economic crises. Poverty was at its all-time high. Could the church go on with a plan, which for many at that time was unrealistically ambitious? Poverty did not hinder the church members in giving their voluntary contributions. They consulted the Bible and followed the example set by the members of the first century Church of Christ. Now friends, I want to report on the surprising and generous ways in which God is working in the churches in Macedonia province. Fierce troubles came down on the people of those churches, pushing them to the very limit. The trial exposed their true colors. They were incredibly happy, though desperately poor. The pressure triggered something totally unexpected, an outpouring of pure and generous gifts. I was there and saw it for myself. They gave offerings of whatever they could, far more than they could afford pleading for the privilege of helping out in the relief of poor Christians. Despite the country's fiscal crises, the church proceeded with the construction of the central temple, the Iglesia Ni Cristo's largest worship building which could seat over 7,000 worshipers. Dedicating it to God, a thanksgiving worship service was held on the 70th anniversary of the Iglesia Ni Cristo. This was followed by more construction projects of the church.
it obviously shows an institution that is is uh, pretty healthy and it, it is able to mobilize its resources in a way to uh, to provide a uh, a church building uh, uh, from which its its outreach its miss missional activities can be carried forth but I understand it's within the church that you uh, uh, don't get loans from the outside. This is entirely within the, the uh, church uh, structure. So uh, pretty impressive to say the least. The year was 1989, a witness to turning points in the history of mankind. In spite of the world's problems, the Iglesia de Cristo continued to reap successes. It celebrated its 75th foundation anniversary. Leaders of nations sent their warm greetings and congratulations. Brethren all over the world offered praises and glory to God in a thanksgiving worship service. One of these was the one held at the INC Central Temple. Hundreds of thousands of brethren attended, many unable to enter the temple, gathered along Commonwealth Avenue. As the church's progress continued to soar, the world's situation continued in its rapid decline. The years that followed the Diamond Jubilee celebration of the Iglesia de Cristo were afflicted by numerous disasters, both natural and man-made. One of the most severe of these calamities was also one of the largest volcanic eruptions in the 20th century. Millions of people in the central Luzon area of the Philippines were severely affected by the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. Hundreds of thousands were left homeless. There was no food. Towns were buried in the mud flow. No one knew where to go. The faith of the brethren was put to the test, and they responded with faith. Even with their homes now gone, the first thing many members of the church in the affected area sought after the calamity was a place where they could pray and hold worship services to God. This made finding and gathering them together so much easier. Brother Iranyu Manalo was quick in addressing the needs of the brethren. Through the collaborative efforts of the various church departments and of the Christian family organizations, SCAN and social service departments, the Iglesia de Cristo was one of the first to provide Lingap Samama Mayan, aid to humanity, to the affected areas. Brother Iranyu also immediately laid out a rehabilitation program to take care of the brethren's welfare. Immediately, the homeless members of the Iglesia de Cristo were relocated to Palayan City, Nueva Ecija, where many were able to start life anew through various livelihood programs initiated by the church administration. And that also provided the, in a sense, a mutual help among the followers, economic and social support network among the church members. I think this is very, very important for the growth of the church. So in a sense, your church provides spiritual salvation, but at the same time, social economic support for the members of the church. Many outside observers witness how the Iglesia de Cristo remain united in helping the brethren who are affected by the calamities. Brother Iranyo's leadership in caring for the poor throughout his administration of the Iglesia de Cristo was also lauded by many non-members as well. An instance of this was in 1991, when he called on the Philippine president and the national leadership to roll back oil prices because the government's policies had been causing too much suffering on the millions of poor in the country. As one newspaper columnist wrote in his column, Iranyo Manalo Day, Henceforth, the 22nd day of July might well be known as Iranyo Manalo Day, both a secular and religious public holiday. We will explain to our progeny that it is a day specifically set aside for the nation to acknowledge the great gift of a nationalistic religious sect, which in the nick of time saved millions of poverty-stricken Filipinos from a cruel lingering death at the hands of the multinational oil companies in partnership with a foreign creditor's cowed administration. In all its activities, unity has remained a central characteristic of the Iglesia de Cristo. 
Since the Bible defines the church as the one body of Christ with its members bound together by one faith, maintaining the cohesiveness of the church has been a priority of the church administration. With the church being global, having various nationalities and races with varying cultures as its members, Brother Iranya Manal looked to the latest technology as a means of reaching the members of the church all over the world with God's message. In the early part of 1994, the first Satellite Connected International Conference of Ministers was held as a precursor to the upcoming celebration of the church's 80th anniversary. A few months later, in May of 1994, broadcast live via satellite to several locations around the world, was the worship service led by Brother Iranya Manalo that also included an ordination of ministers, several of whom had come from the overseas congregations. It was also on that occasion that Brother Eduardo V. Manalo, Brother Iranyo's eldest, and a minister who had been serving as coordinator of Metro Manila, took oath as the Deputy Executive Minister of the Iglesia Ni Cristo. Ako ang si Eduardo V. Manalo, ministro sa Iglesia Ni Cristo, na lumitaw sa Pilipinas sa bisa ng mga hula ng banal na kasulatan at sa pagsusugo ng Diyos kay kapatid na Felix Y. Manalo, ay nagpapahayag na aking tinatanggap ang tungkulin pangalawang tagapamahalang pangkalahatag. Tutuparin ko ng buong puso at pagmamalasakit ang lahat ng pananagutan at kampaning nasasaklaw ng tungkulin ito o juk ng pag-ibig sa Diyos kay Kristo at sa Kanyang Iglesia upang mapangalagaan ang mga hinirang sa ikatutupad ng layunin ng Diyos na ang lahat ay maihatid sa kaligtasan. Aking ipinangangako na susundin ko ipatutupad at ipagsasanggalang ang mga aral ng Diyos na nakasulat sa Biblia at ang lahat ng mga tuntuning pinaiiral ng Iglesia ni Kristo. Akin ding ipinangangako na ako'y buong kababaang loob na magpapasakop sa tagapamahalang pangkalahatan ng Iglesia ni Kristo sa huling araw. Tulungan nawa ako ng Diyos. The church continued on to reap victories from place to place. By July of 1994, Brother Iranyo Manalo was in Rome for the registration of the church in the country where the early church fell into apostasy. The worship service to mark this occasion was also broadcast live to several sites around the world, including the multitude of brethren gathered in the Central Office Pavilion in celebration of the church's 80th anniversary. Two years later, on March 31, 1996, the executive minister came to the city of Jerusalem in Israel for the establishment of the congregation in the very city where the first century Church of Christ was founded by the Lord Jesus Christ. On May 10, 1997, Brother Iranyo led the establishment of the congregation in Athens, Greece, signifying the extension of the Gentile mission. This special event in the Iglesia Ni Cristo's history also coincided with the 50th anniversary of Brother Iranyo's ordination as a minister of the gospel. In 1998, the entire Iglesia Ni Cristo celebrated the 30th anniversary of the church in the far west through various activities. In 2000, upon the instruction of Brother Eranio Manalo, then Deputy Executive Minister Brother Eduardo Manalo, was sent to the West for a series of pastoral visitations and ministerial conferences, bringing great joy and edifying the faith of the church members. Because of its contributions in the fields of community development, agrarian reforms, education, and socio-economic programs, the Iglesia Ni Cristo, which was once looked down upon as a church from a developing country, received recognition and appreciation from international institutions and governments. In July 2009, the church celebrated its 95th anniversary with a program commemorating God's blessings to His church. The main celebrations were held in 14 selected venues in the Philippines and five sites in the U.S.
At this time, the church has achieved outstanding and unimaginable successes in all fields. The Iglesia de Cristo, on its way to its 100 years, was eager to celebrate God's blessings. Every detail of the centennial program was in its planning stage. The propagation campaigns in celebration for the centennial, having been laid out since 2006, were geared towards success. The brethren grew more eager to participate in activities, and their fervor in upholding their church duties served as a testament that they wanted to be a part of the centennial. When everything was well on its way, leading to a great and joyful celebration, news broke out. It is with deep regret and sorrow that I inform the entire membership of the Iglesia de Cristo and the nation that our beloved leader, our executive minister, Brother Iranio G. Manalo, passed away at his home at 3.53 p.m. yesterday, August 31, 2009, at the age of 84. Not just members of the Iglesia de Cristo, but the whole nation mourned for several days. Even many non-members joined an endless flow of brethren traveling from different parts of the world and waited in line for hours just to have one last glimpse of their dear leader, their beloved brother. The large crowd that filled several kilometers running along Commonwealth and Central Avenue was a testament not only of the love of those millions for Brother Iranio G. Manalo, but even more so of his love for them. Today, his burial site is a mausoleum located in the central office complex, but standing as an even bigger monument to his inspired leadership is a remarkable list of accomplishments of the INC as the church poised for a future even more remarkable. Gusto natin ang iglesia ay tumatag. Ang sabi ng Biblia, ang Diyos ang magpapatatag sa bansa, ang Diyos ang mag-iingat sa kanyang bayan, ang Diyos ang magbibigay ng karunungan at kaalaman. Kailan? Kung ang bayang yon, ang pangunahing yaman, ay ang paggalang, ang paggalang sa Panginoon Diyos. Eh pero mga kapatid, kung narinig ninyo ang sabi ng Diyos, Kapag ka kayo nagkaisa ng diwa at puso sa pagsunod sa akin, ito'y para sa inyong kabutihan hanggang sa inyong mga anak. Yan po lang ang susi. Simpleng simple lang. Ang susi ng tagumpay, ang susi ng ikatatatag ng iglesia, ang susi para sa ikapagkakaroon ng magandang wakas. Hindi ko ba sabi ko sa inyo kanina na magsama-sama tayo na ang yakapi naman natin ipagsunod. Kaya mga kapatid, tandaan nyo sabi ng Diyos, pag ginawa natin yung bahagi natin, gagawin niya yung bahagi niya. Ano yun? Pagpapalain ko kayo habang panahon. Patatatagin ko kayo. Sabi ng Diyos, buong puso at kaluluwa, gagawin ko sa inyo yan. Ano kailangan ng iglesia? Ang kailangan ng iglesia, may Espiritu Santo. Ang kailangan ng iglesia, binubuhusan ng Diyos ng kanyang Espiritu. Bakit ano ba yung Espiritu? Yun ang patutuo na sumasama ang Diyos sa iyo. Ang sabi ng Diyos, lakasan mo ang iyong loob sa paglaban alang-alang sa iyong kahalalan. Ipakipaglaban mo yung kahalalan. Saan po tayo inaaki? Pagka dumating sa ating buhay, ang katulad ng narinig ninyong nilalamon ng pagkabagabag, ng lulupaypay dahil sa pagdurusa, ang sabi niya, pati buto ko ay nanghihina. Ngunit, ako'y nagtitiwala sa iyo, Panginoon, na ikaw ang aking Diyos at ang aking panahonin na sa iyong mga kamay. Paliliwanagin mo ang aking mukha at ako'y ililigtas mo sa pamagitan ng pag-ibig mong hindi kumukupas. Ano po ang dapat na maging damdamin ng mga Iglesia ni Kristo? Pagka dumarating ang hirap, parisa ninyo ang sabi ng Biblia, 
kapag ka ikaw ang aking kasama, anuman ang hirap ay aking masasalun. Like Brother Felix Y. Manalo, the executive minister before him, Brother Iranio led the Iglesia Ni Cristo triumphantly with a constant parade of successes. Brother Iranio had witnessed how the church, since the time of the messenger, the first executive minister, became strong because God blessed the church for upholding the biblical principles of unity. Throughout his administration of the Iglesia Ni Cristo, Brother Iranio also saw how God continued to bless the church as it maintained its unity under his leadership as its one executive minister. To do this, to truly remain one body upholding one true faith, the entire Iglesia Ni Cristo must continue to recognize, even long after he would be gone, only one overall leader, the man who would be the next executive minister. On May 6, 1994, in a meeting called by Brother Iranio Manalo, all of the church's district ministers, along with the executive minister's senior staff, took part in a historic meeting at the session hall of the Central Temple. In that meeting, Brother Eduardo Manalo was unanimously elected as Deputy Executive Minister. At the time, Brother Eduardo was a minister of the gospel assigned as the coordinator supervising the Metro Manila districts. The following day, in a special worship service broadcast live via satellite to several congregations around the world, Brother Iranio presented to the entire church the man who would one day succeed him as Brother Eduardo took oath as Deputy Executive Minister of the Iglesia Ni Cristo, the Church of Christ. In the Bible, during the time of ancient Israel as God's chosen people, Moses had prepared Joshua and King David had prepared Solomon. At the start of the Christian era, the Lord Jesus had prepared the Apostles, with Apostle James making the final decisions for the first century Church of Christ. In the same way, Brother Iranio saw that Brother Felix had prepared him. Now, it was his turn to prepare Brother Eduardo. In all the years that followed since the oath-taking in 1994, it was Brother Iranio himself who guided and taught Brother Eduardo in the administration of the entire church. And it was Brother Eduardo whom he would send not only all over the Philippines, but also on visitations to see the condition of the church in different parts of the world. These visitations included officiating the worship services in celebration of the 30th anniversary of the Iglesia Ni Cristo in the West in July of 1998, with the auditoriums of the Neil Bladesdale Center in Honolulu, Hawaii, and the San Jose Civic Center in San Jose, California, filled to capacity with brethren. Two years later, Brother Eduardo was sent on an exhaustive whirlwind tour to the United States, visiting 16 local congregations and conducting three separate conferences of ministers and evangelical workers, covering thousands of miles in over four weeks. In 2006, Brother Iranio also sent Brother Eduardo to visit congregations in Europe, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia. Brother Iranio wanted to make sure that Brother Eduardo could see the condition of the entire church all over the world, while at the same time, the brethren could also know the one who would eventually lead them. On August 31, 2009, barely a month after the Iglesia Ni Cristo's 95th anniversary, Brother Iranio Manalo passed away. Sadness gripped the entire church. With the passing of Brother Iranio, it was time for the Deputy Executive Minister, Brother Eduardo Manalo, to step in as Executive Minister of the Iglesia Ni Cristo. All members of the church knew that Brother Iranio already had a well-prepared successor. When the eventual time would come for him to be laid to rest, Brother Iranio did not want the church to be overcome with grief. Never should the mission of salvation be immobilized or stagnant, no matter how painful the trials are. All the more, the Iglesia Ni Cristo should be called to action with the Day of Salvation drawing closer ever faster. The challenges that uh, your founder had uh, many years ago 
are quite different from the challenges that Ka Eduardo now face faces. No? So, um, so it's it's a different era, different set of challenges for him as a leader. I think he was uh, he's well prepared for for the challenges ahead. So, I have no doubt that the uh, Iglesia will continue to prosper under his leadership, no? as it has under his his predecessors. On September 7, 2009, Brother Eduardo officially assumed the office of the Executive Minister of the Iglesia de Cristo. He was faced with a daunting task and several formidable challenges not only of leading the entire church from great sadness. The task, overseeing millions of his brothers and sisters in the faith, found all over the world in faithfully obeying the Bible-based teachings of the church. The challenges destructive and even more frequent natural calamities, global economic crisis, rapidly declining moral values, and what many experts have labeled a worsening religious recession. To respond to this difficult task, Brother Eduardo followed the example in the Bible of the leaders of the first century Church of Christ. Paul said, Let's go back and visit all the brothers and sisters in every city where we preach the Lord's word. Let's see how they are doing. Immediately attending to the spiritual needs of the brethren, Brother Eduardo began a series of exhausting pastoral visitations that would end up taking him without rest several times circling the globe. The task was not easy. Visiting brethren thousands of miles apart, crossing various time zones while still keeping abreast of all the church's needs was grueling and even dangerous. The office of the executive minister was not only in Quezon City, Philippines, but wherever in the world he was visiting. From country to country, one local congregation to another, he brought to his beloved brothers and sisters in the faith the words of God and preached to them the same message taught by the previous executive ministers of the church. In just five years, Brother Eduardo conducted over 250 pastoral visitations, leading worship services in different parts of the globe. In his homilies, Brother Eduardo reminded the brethren that although Brother Urano was laid to rest, he had not left them defenseless in the good fight for the faith. Even until the last moment of his life, Brother Urano worked so hard that every church member could remain assured of salvation on Judgment Day. The brethren were reminded that Brother Urano had laid for them a strong foundation for their faith, as it was anchored not on Brother Urano, but on the true gospel first preached in these last days by God's messenger. From great sorrow emerged a church greatly edified. Even when the church was still recovering from grief, problems began to come one after the other. Well, uh, certainly calamities uh, are a major uh, problem, no? It, it, because typhoons visit us regularly and we don't always seem to be prepared for it. Quickly responding to the calamities, the church administration, through the leadership of Brother Eduardo, consolidated the church resources and extended help to members of the Iglesia de Cristo, as well as non-members. Brother Eduardo immediately called for a meeting of ministers and church workers and instructed them to lead the church through these afflictions. He encouraged them to carry on with what the former leaders had labored and sacrificed for, to lead the church towards spiritual maturity and perfect unity. In this way, no matter what the situation in life may be, no matter how strong the calamities that come, church members will remain holding on to the hope of salvation on Judgment Day. On the part of the, of the Kapatids, or the followers of the church, the degree of devotion that they display uh, to their to their faith is 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 admirable, no? and on the part of the church itself, you could see things are well organized. The attention to detail is a, is is uh, is uh, superior, no? uh, comparable to to well-run organization. So um, nothing is left to chance. Uh, you could sense that you anticipate issues around the corner, you address those issues realistically, and um, the care with which you pay attention to, to solving those problems are, again, uh, first class. 
The church, on its way to its centennial celebration, continued to actively launch various endeavors for the brethren's edification and propagation. They continue to participate in the evangelism project that every member brings someone to the faith to bring honor and glory to God. As the church prepared for the centennial, a challenge arose. The church had no place to hold the gathering, a place where a huge number of attendees could be accommodated. Because of this, the church administration approved the construction of the Philippine Arena. The 55,000 seating capacity theater-like building upon completion would be the world's largest domed arena. The executive minister envisioned the Philippine Arena as the centerpiece for the Ciudad de Victoria, which literally means City of Victory. Also to be constructed concurrently in the Ciudad de Victoria with the Philippine Arena are the Philippine Sports Stadium, the Philippine Sports Center, with future plans as well for a modern well-equipped hospital, the EGM Medical Center, a medical school, other extensions of the New Era University, such as the New Era Sports Academy and other facilities. In the Ciudad de Victoria, Brother Eduardo envisioned an ecotourism center that could be used not only for the large-scale church activities, but also for the development of the central Luzon and the hosting of international events for the welfare and benefit of the entire Philippines. And I think it will bring a lot of uh, honor to our country and also it will be the venue for all the big, biggest event. And I think that arena can also be used for helping the poor. For the Iglesia Ni Cristo Centennial Celebration, the church administration outlined three goals, all based on the Holy Scriptures. To praise and thank our Almighty God, who has been upholding and loving the Iglesia Ni Cristo for 100 years. To remember all the great deeds that the hand of God has done for the Iglesia Ni Cristo in these last days. And to leave a lasting memory for the next generation of members of the Iglesia Ni Cristo. Early on, it was clear to the executive minister that the celebration of 100 years of God's blessings to the church would require the talents of the brethren from all over the world. At the same time, he could see the growing threat to the members' spiritual lives and the culture of permissiveness of the world surrounding the members. Around the world, in other religions and churches all over the world, there has been a diminishing number of attendees in their fellowship gatherings or their masses. Certainly in Western cultures, that which used to be Christendom, um, it might be a depression in parts of Europe, a, a little depression in Canada, and a great recession here in the United States. The Brethren's faith was not only under assault by a great religious recession, the Iglesia Ni Cristo families, especially the youth, were also threatened by the spread of moral degradation with things as simple as pop songs or television shows promoting activities and a lifestyle contrary to biblical Christian principles. To keep the members from being pulled in the same direction as the declining conditions of the world around them, the church administration took steps to further develop the Christian family organizations consisting of the Buklod, Kadiwa, and Binhi organizations. While still Deputy Executive Minister, under the administration of Brother Iranio Manalo, Brother Eduardo had already brought proposals to the Executive Minister to continuously address directly the attack on Christian values through various media. He also released animated documentaries about the Sugo and Brother Iranio to help the youth understand and value their compassionate labor for the church. As a composer and arranger himself, Brother Eduardo has continuously encouraged brethren to compose music for the church. He has produced and released CDs of contemporary Christian music and audiobooks featuring Bible verse reading paired with original INC hymns, which are all based on the books and lessons of executive ministers before him. The ideals of Brother Felix and Brother Urano have always been the inspiration of Brother Eduardo's projects. As executive minister, Brother Eduardo appointed his son, Brother Angelo Urano Manalo, a minister of the gospel, coordinator of the Christian Family Organizations, or CFO, to ensure the success of the various activities and projects launched by the CFO. And these activities have flourished. 
The activities under the CFO have aided in not only developing the skills and talents of the brethren, but also in helping oversee them to keep them away from societal ills that have become pervasive all over the world. Um, there are high standards in terms of family life, in terms of uh, social life within the INC. Through all these activities of the church, the brethren were taught to carry on, fight for, and win the good fight of faith. My dear friends, I was doing my best to write you about the salvation we share in common when I felt the need of writing at once to encourage you to fight on for the faith which once and for all God has given to His people. As a result, the Iglesia de Cristo has not become a victim of religious recession. Instead, through God's help and mercy, the Iglesia de Cristo has shown rapid progression, rapid expansion. While developing more ways to edify the faith of the members of the Iglesia de Cristo, Brother Eduardo Manalo continued the church's mission of bringing more people to the path of salvation. In doing this, the church administration taught an important principle to succeed. So no matter what your task is, work hard. Always do your best as the Lord's servant, not as man's. The church campaigned for the intensive propagation of God's words while expanding the means for the message to reach more people. SEBSI was launched to directly oversee the expansion of INC TV and INC Radio. An integral part of the SEBSI's growth has been its concentration not only in the English and Filipino languages. Most shows now include sign language, and shows now air in Japanese, French, Spanish, German, Mandarin, and other languages. Sharing the faith through the internet also began by means of the church's various websites. More and more people became interested in attending the Bible studies and worship services in the church. As an outsider or as a non-member, uh, you know, you, you feel the sincerity of the people. Uh, in the church and sincerity you feel the passion you know the passion for service to Christ it's not just just service to Christ of course but service to humanity to others you know which is very uh, you know very important and uh, you know that's what would attract uh, non-members uh, immigrants new immigrants uh, uh, you know to the Iglesia Ni Cristo Church. I fully admire the Iglesia Ni Cristo. Why? because of the passionate faithfulness of the members Jesus Christ. You know, I wish that our relationship could be as passionate in the faithfulness. To further intensify the missionary works, the church continued to proclaim the words of God both in great and small assemblies. I proclaim righteousness in the great assembly. See, I do not keep my mouth closed. As you know, Lord, I did not hide your righteousness in my heart. I spoke about your faithfulness and salvation. I did not conceal your constant love and truth from the great assembly. The Brethren's commitment to share the news of salvation led to a remarkable increase in the Church's membership worldwide. With congregations spreading all over the world, the church was conducting baptisms practically every day. I believe that the INC, if the numbers are true, uh, sort of in the five to seven million range, uh, may be the largest form of Christianity, of indigenous Christianity, one of the largest certainly, and uh, one of the few that is uh, uh, exporting itself, that it has begun missional activity outside of the region in, in which it was born. In the case of the Philippines uh, for the INC, INC seems to be pretty unique in that respect. Seeing the great willingness of the brethren to share their faith, the church administration further intensified its campaign for propagation and launched the project Abundant Fruit Bearing, based on the words of the Lord Jesus in John 15, 16 and 8. 
With the Iglesia de Cristo's brilliant success in propagation, an important mandate from God needed to be fulfilled by the church administration. God says so. Clear lots of ground for your tents. Make your tents large. Spread out. Think big. Use plenty of rope. Drive the tent pegs deep. You're going to need lots of elbow room for your growing family. You're going to take over whole nations. You're going to resettle abandoned cities. The church needed bigger and more worship buildings to accommodate the continuously increasing number of church members. Since all the projects of the Iglesia de Cristo, including the construction of worship buildings, are all financed by means of the voluntary contributions of the members, a challenge was only getting bigger. Church members could be found in countries that were gravely affected by financial crises before. But this problem was different. Many churches uh, that, are being, that were being built at that time in the United States were encumbered with pretty significant uh, loans. There were uh, repeated references to churches that were losing their buildings, uh, or that were, being, um, were going bankrupt, that they simply couldn't maintain the loans. Uh, hundreds of thousands uh, did either uh, put their construction on hold or uh, found it very difficult to service their loans. Innumerable religious organizations were forced to sell the buildings they used for their religious services. Facing this difficult situation, the church administration encouraged all brethren to hold on to God's words and the Bible for guidance. What you do to serve others not only provides for the needs of God's people, but also produces more and more prayers of thanksgiving to God. You will honor God through this genuine act of service because of your commitment to spread the good news of Christ and because of your generosity in sharing with them and everyone else. The executive minister carried on with the church's plan to put in order appropriate and dignified worship buildings for local congregations where members all over the world could worship God. And true to his promises, God helped the church overcome the challenges. Because of religious crises and fiscal needs, religions and churches are putting their buildings up for sale. Out of God's mercy, the Iglesia de Cristo was able to purchase many of these historic and landmark buildings, like the ones in Barcelona, Spain, Chicago, Illinois, Belfast, North Ireland, and Birmingham, England, saving them from completely shutting down. The church administration even approved that they be renovated to make them even more fitting for worship services. Now, after dedication to God, these buildings have been open to welcome not only members of the church, but also non-members in the community. The executive minister, Brother Eduardo Manalo, led the dedication of over 50 such Iglesia de Cristo worship buildings. Meanwhile, in the Philippines, over 600 worship buildings were constructed and dedicated to God in less than five years. And no matter where you are in the Philippines, the cleanest building that stands out is always the Iglesia de Cristo. I think finances is a very critical part of religion and church building. You know, the Iglesia de Cristo Church has shown that it's very accountable in terms of finances. And when you have accountable finances, people, of course, trust you. So there's a big trust factor. Uh, with the Iglesia de Cristo because of the, you know, the, you know, the, the, how finances are managed. Since the life of God's people revolve around God's words in the Bible, leading every local congregation is a minister of the gospel entrusted to preach God's message and feed the members of the Church of Christ with God's words. As the church continues spreading rapidly around the world, the mission of the church in edification and propagation has a constant need for more ministers. As a result, the executive minister has been ordaining ministers of the gospel. On January 2, 2010, in commemoration of the 85th birth anniversary of Brother Urano G. Manalo, barely four months after his passing, Brother Eduardo conducted his first ordination of ministers. 202 ministers were ordained on that occasion, including 63 coming from assignments in different parts of the world. 
This was succeeded by more ordinations not only in the Philippines, but also abroad, including those which were held in Humboldt, Texas, Heathrow, London, and Rome, Italy. On December 28, 2011, the first ordination outside the Philippines was held in Humboldt, Texas in the United States. On June 1, 2013, in Battersea, London in the United Kingdom, the first ordination of ministers was held in Europe. To date, Brother Eduardo has ordained over 2,500 ministers, including his son, Brother Angelo Iranio Manalo. To succeed even further in the task of evangelizing people from different cultures around the world, the church administration has made sure that the training of ministers at the College of Evangelical Ministry would continue to be enhanced. Brother Eduardo sponsored workshops in writing and translations and seminars for ministerial students, carrying on what the former executive ministers wanted for ministers, to be trained in all fields beneficial to the church. The executive minister also initiated the establishment of various campuses for the school in different provinces and opened the Iglesia Cristo School for Ministry in Sacramento, California. More campuses are set to open in large cities in the Philippines and major cities worldwide, such as Rome, Italy, London, England, Toronto, Canada, and Sydney, Australia, for the training of ministers of the church. Meanwhile, thousands of new enrollees from various nationalities have been enrolling at CEM, prompting the church to construct a bigger and more modern school building along Central Avenue in Quezon City. Its inauguration is part of the year-long celebration of the church's centennial. To properly administer the spiritual well-being of the Iglesia de Cristo members and efficiently carry out all the projects of the church, the church administration expanded the various departments of the church and directed the construction of more office buildings in the central office complex. Administrative buildings were also expanded in the ecclesiastical districts around the world. 10 district office buildings, Europe main office, US main office. He also inaugurated new buildings in the central office complex, including one for the INC engineering and construction department the Honorata de Guzman Manalo Building for the Finance Department and Legal Department, and the Pilar Manalo Danao Building for the Choir and for Multimedia Projects. But in terms of organizational structure and in terms of, uh, um, of, of church management, uh, and now international church management, uh, the INC may be one of the best. The Iglesia Cristo also further advanced the New Era University by offering more courses and improving its facilities. So education is again the key for the future of the humankind. And I think we are doing a lot to educate, right? To improve the literacy rate of the church members and the children of your members. New Era University has not slowed down in expanding its educational offerings. The College of Music was launched in 2011, the College of Medicine in 2014. Being readied for opening as well are more undergraduate, graduate, and even vocational courses, all aimed at promoting quality education anchored on Christian virtues. The Church's care for educational opportunities for all can also be felt in the world-class facilities that have been allotted for NEU SPED, an educational program for children with special needs. The church continued to reap success from one place to another. The situation of people's lives, however, was getting worse. Well, poverty existed, but it's not as severe as it is today. Uh, because, number one, the population is not as big as it is today. Uh, the cost of living was, is not as high as it is today. Well, you know, the vulnerable group of people are not necessarily confined to the Philippines. It's all over in any countries. You know that the number of people who are living with only one dollar a day, more than two billion. We have seven billion people, but two billion people, 
it with less than one dollar a day. Can you believe? Two dollars a day, one billion people. So there are neglect, so many neglected people, and it's increasing as the population itself grows. At the same time. Natural disasters and calamities, which the Bible had foretold and the church administration has been warning people about, have not stopped escalating in intensity and scope. Devastating calamities that were once considered unusual have now become usual and have been getting worse in all regions of the world, leaving millions homeless and impoverished. The members of the Iglesia de Cristo demonstrated powerfully that their care in saving people was not only for the day of judgment, but even in this life. During the administration of Brother Iranio Manalo, Brother Eduardo had formed with the Executive Minister's blessing the organization known as SCAN, or the Society of Communicators and Networkers. Originally begun as an amateur ham radio group to link people all over the world for the sharing of the true faith, the organization expanded. With phone lines and cell phone towers down during times of calamity and radios the only effective means of communication, SCAN members began taking part in first aid and search and rescue operations while also assisting in the maintenance of peace and order. As dangerous typhoons, floods, and other natural calamities increased, SCAN members waded into the danger areas and many lives were saved. The Iglesia de Cristo's help for calamity victims did not stop there. Always inspired to obey the commandments of God. If there are poor, needy among you, your relatives or your countrymen, your brothers, in one of the town's gates of the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not be selfish, hard-hearted, or greedy, tight-fisted toward them. There will always be poor people in the land, so I command you to give freely. Open your hand to your neighbors, or relatives, or countrymen, brothers, and to the poor and needy in your land. The church intensified its efforts to extend help to those in need. On the 4th of February 2011, FYM Foundation was registered in the Philippines and in the United States on the 17th of May 2012. Through the FYM Foundation and various church offices, the church has been one of the first to be on site in the hard-hit calamity areas for search and rescue operations and for the giving of free medical services and food packs to victims, whether or not they are members of the church. Because of the expanse of the humanitarian works the church had provided, its international aid for humanity activities have set Guinness World Records. The church set three Guinness World Records on February 28, 2012 during its massive international aid for humanity activity that was held in Parola, Manila in the Philippines. In addition to distributing hundreds of thousands of food and relief good packages to the poor, world records were set in areas of most blood pressure readings taken in eight hours, most numerous blood glucose level tests in eight hours, and largest dental health check. And I've seen the Iglesia de Cristo you know, help out, whether, you know, a mayor here asks for a cleanup, help in cleaning up, you know, graffiti in, in streets, uh, you know, in a food drive, there's a hurricane. Uh, one, of the, one of the churches that, uh, you know, volunteers, one of the first churches to volunteer is the Iglesia de Cristo. What I would say about the Iglesia social work is that it is a bit more quiet, but you could sense that it is there when needed. No? You will always be there uh, when needed by the people. No? Not only, I think, with respect to your followers, but even with respect to Filipinos in general. The Iglesia has not fallen short at all in terms of what, uh, what the Church feels it should do to the community. On November 8, 2013, Typhoon Haiyan, locally known as Typhoon Yolanda, brought immense destruction to the Philippines. Conveying a strong message to the whole world to never stop caring and extending help to the victims. Members of the Iglesia de Cristo all over the world united for a common cause and held the worldwide walk for those affected by Typhoon Haiyan. February 15, 2014. 
setting more Guinness World Records in the process, including the largest number of participants in a charity event and largest charity walk in 24 hours. The executive minister himself went to Tacloban Leyte to lead the groundbreaking of the EVM Self-Sustainable Community Resettlement Project where initially 1,000 houses are to be constructed along with the eco-farming, garment factory, and fish drying factory. I'm aware of it that uh, you got that, that big eco-project uh, in, in Leyte near the globe. And I you know, followed it on the internet, uh, the opening, and groundbreaking. Uh, I think it's a, it's a fantastic project. For a start, you have the, um, the community uh, setter, uh, help the, uh, the homeless, you get new homes, create employment. Uh, apparently, you're building several factories and also, um, you know, land development. Um, that, you know, has a big impact on, uh, especially after this uh, tragic uh, typhoon. It has a, an impact and it helps a lot of people. So that's a wonderful effort, and you know, as you say, with the um, development in uh, in Leyte, I suppose you got other projects as well. Um, I mean, it's it's benefit it benefits the community in general, and and uh, create employment, and you know, keep the family together, give them a new start in life. Hence, the church has been launching programs to protect the environment, such as cleanup drives tree planting projects, and eco-farming. Important law to reduce the social inequity to provide safety net for the poor people. Well, I think we continue to speak out against the social injustice. And you can also discipline your members to be productive but with the sensitivity to environmental issues. Meanwhile, the Iglesia de Cristo has also been combining the sharing of the people's two basic needs. The Lord Jesus Christ once said, Man cannot live on bread alone, but needs every word that God speaks. Under the My Countrymen, My Brethren campaign, the Church has conducted what it calls in Filipino, Linga Pamamahayag, or International Aid for Humanity and Evangelical Mission. In these activities, the Church provides medical services and distributes free food packs to all visitors along with the brethren who attend, after delivering to them the words of God. In less than five years, the Church has invited over 50 million people to its Linga Pamamahayag. Hundreds of thousands have also expressed their willingness to join the Iglesia de Cristo. This activity continues to be held regularly in different parts of the world. In the INC Central Temple, the sweet sounds of victory and giving glory to God the Most High have been coming out even more beautifully and powerfully. On July 5, 2014, in a worship service led by Brother Eduardo Manalo, a new 20-ton pipe organ was used for the first time. This organ, consisting of over 3,000 individual pipes, was designed specifically for the Central Temple by the world-renowned A.E. Schluter Pipe Organ Company based in Georgia. On July 19, 2014, one of the largest and most beautiful houses of worship of the Iglesia de Cristo, a 3,000-seater worship building for the local congregation of Capitol in Quezon City, was dedicated in a special worship service officiated by the Executive Minister. And the victory parade continues. It's 100 years now, no? and I must congratulate the, the leaders of the Iglesia de Cristo for keeping the community uh, dynamic. It's alive, it's flourishing, not just in this country, but in the rest of the world where Filipinos and, and even non-Filipinos. On July 24, 2014, the director of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines visited the central office complex and unveiled with Brother Eduardo Manalo the historical marker, signifying the government's recognition of the Iglesia de Cristo in the history of the Philippines. 
This monument is located near the very center of the compound. During the ceremony, the executive minister cited Jeremiah 9.23 to 24. Ganito ang sabi ng Panginoon, Huwag magmapuri ang marunong sa kanyang karunungan at huwag magmapuri ang makapangyarihan sa kanyang kapangyarihan. Huwag magmapuri ang mayaman sa kanyang kayamanan kundi ang nagmamapuri ay dito magmapuri na kanyang nauunawaan at nakikilala ako na ako ang Panginoon na nagsasagawa ng kagandahang loob ng katarungan at ng katwiran sa daigdig sapagkat sa mga bagay nito ay nalulugod ako sabi ng Panginoon. Delegates from over 100 countries and territories have arrived in the Philippines. Tricolor flags drape the canopy of worship buildings. The celebratory mood is in the air. All over Manila, Iglesia de Cristo Centennial banners hang on every major street. On July 27, 2014, the church held a special worship service led by the executive minister, Brother Eduardo V. Manalo, in the newly inaugurated Philippine Arena. The 55,000-seater Mammoth Building and its adjacent Philippine Sports Stadium were not only filled to capacity, but more than 2 million worshippers as well gathered outside in tents and courtyards where plasma screens were set up. The worship service was broadcast live to more than 1,500 sites all over the world. The fruits of the church administration's care in overseeing the brethren and the Christian family organizations were abundant. A few hours after the special worship service, an oratory was held in the Philippine arena, with musical pieces written by members of the church and performed by brethren who came from all over the world. With these activities, the church has once again set two new Guinness World Records. These events were followed two days later by a multimedia experience, the musical Ang Bayan Moy Nagpupuri, Your Nation Praises You, that also included brethren who are Broadway performers. Two days after the musical about the history of the church, a stage play was held, which included members of the church who are professional actors and actresses in the Philippine stage and cinema, about the life of God's messenger aptly entitled Ang Sugo, a stage play. On August 1, also held in the Philippine arena, was the first international Tagisa ng Talino contest, a friendly competition among young church members aged 4 to 11 years old for them to learn more about the teachings of the Bible and the church's history. The next day, the 55,000 seats in the Philippine arena and the huge expansive lobby area were filled to capacity for the evangelical mission, as brethren joyously and devotedly shared the good news about God's master plan for salvation for the church through the Lord Jesus Christ. Ciudad de Victoria is not just a religious site. Surely it was constructed by Iglesia de Cristo. New Era University will have its new hospital there, new campus there, new sports facilities there. So it's not just the Philippine Arena, it's the entire city of victory, the Ciudad de Victoria, right? And which has not just religious but secular purposes. That's the concept of religious worlding, an appeal to the world that it has arrived not just by constructing another religious site but but constructing what is, could be a global marker, a world-class marker. Ciudad de Victoria is religious worlding. So in that sense, Iglesia de Cristo is no longer a Filipino religion, it is a world religion. All of the successes that the Iglesia de Cristo has achieved became possible because of only one reason. Ang sabi sa atin ng Biblia, magkaroon anya kayo ng espiritu ng pagkakaisa. Paano natin patutunayan ang espiritu ng pagkakaisa ay nasa atin, sa atin anyang pagsunod sa mga utos sa atin ng ating Panginoong Sokristo. Yan ang dahilan kung bakit lagi ninyong naririnig, mga kapatid, magkaisa tayo. Gawin natin yung mga aral ng Diyos na itinuturo sa atin. Kailangan natin ng pagsunod. Huwag tayong hihiwalay sa pagsunod. 
hinahanap ng ating Panginoong Diyos, nakikita tayo sa lubos na pagkakaisa, sa espiritu ng pagkakaisa, sa pagsunod sa lahat ng mga aral at utos ng Diyos. Sapagat ang sabi ng Biblia, yan ang makaluluwalhati sa ating Panginoong Diyos. As the members of the Iglesia ni Cristo continue to travel in this world, ahead of them, are even greater tests in life. Like athletes swimming against a strong current, members of the church must still struggle through the present times, full of trials and difficulties. But they keep going. They continue to abound in faith, love, and hope, knowing that God has been showing all Iglesia ni Cristo members the way through the church administration he has placed in the church Sati ng Dios pagkakanyang gawain kamanghamangha kagilagilalas pero kung mula anya doon lamang sa karunungan ng mga tao ito anya ay mapapawi ito anya ay maglalaho mga kapatid ito ang aking tanong sa inyo ito ang ating isipin sa nangyayaring ito sa Iglesia ni Kristo at sa nangyayari sa ibang mga relihiyon alin ngayon ang tunay na relihiyon na sa ating Panginoong Diyos? Tama. Totoong ang ating pagka-Iglesia ni Kristo ay totoong sa ating Panginoong Diyos. Salamat sa Diyos sa loob ng isang daang taon ipinagkalob niya sa atin ang kanyang mga pagpapala. Dumaan man tayo sa mga malulungkot na panahon sa ating pagkaiglesa ni Kristo, hindi lamang dahil sa mga pagsubok, hindi lamang dahil sa mga pag-uusig, hindi lamang dahil sa mga kahadlangan, kundi maging ng pumanaw ang sugo at maging ang kapatid na Eranyo Manalo na namahala sa atin sa loob ng iglesia. Akala natin siguro ang iglesia ni Kristo ay hindi na makapagtataguyo. Subalit, pinatutunayan sa atin ng ating Panginoong Diyos hanggang ngayon ang gawain ito ay hawak ng kanyang kamay. Siya ang tunay na Diyos na Diyos nating mga iglesia ni Kristo. Siya may hawak sa gawain ito na ating kinaaniban tayo ay mga tunay na hinirang ng ating Panginoong Diyos.